you for joining Truth in Accounting today for another important conversation on the financial health of our federal government with the Honorable David M. Walker, former Comptroller General of the United States. Mr. Walker is a CPA with 40 years of executive level experience in the public, private, and nonprofit sectors, including heading three federal agencies, two nonprofits, and a global service line for Arthur Anderson LLP. My name is Judy, and I'm the Communications and Development Manager for Truth in Accounting, and we want people to understand that Truth in Accounting is where we cut through the noise of politics beyond left or right. We go straight for the behind-the-scenes standards and processes that are being used to account for our tax resources. So if during today's conversation you would like to ask a question, feel free to use the chat feature because we are going to try to field as many questions as possible because it is our goal to serve you with the necessary education to be knowledgeable participants in government tax and spending decisions. I will now turn it over to Sheila Weinberg, the founder and CEO of Truth and Accounting to start the fun. Sheila, go ahead. Thanks, Judy, and thank you, David, for joining us. Uh, recently, we issued our annual financial state of the states, uh, states, but this is the financial state of the union. Uh, it reported that the federal government needs $153.9 trillion in order to pay for all the bills it's had, plus all of the um, unfunded uh, obligations it has for Social Security and Medicare. If you divide that by the number of taxpayers, each one of you are in the hook for $966,000. Um, in essence, the federal government has created a, an additional credit card that you're going to have to pay off over time to pay for the promises that the Congress and presidents have already made. Unfortunately, that was uh, that's not bad enough news. That was a worsening of $7.9 trillion, and we gave the federal government an F grade. Uh, the reason we're doing this and our other reports is because we just want citizens to have the financial information they need to be knowledgeable participants in their government. You can't advocate for a certain tax or spending policy if you don't know how much debt the government has, how much expenses it has, and how much revenue it has. So our purpose is to provide you with that information. And we're so honored to have David um, join us today. Um, David, did you find anything uh, surprising in our financial state of the union? Well, what I find is that the government likes to talk about the least bad numbers, uh, and uh, they they don't like to provide a full and fair view in a digestible way for the American people to be able to really understand what the situation is. Uh, and furthermore, they tend to talk in terms of trillions and tens of trillions, such that most American Americans can't relate to that. And what you need to do is what you just did. You, you need to convert it into per person, into per household, benchmark it against median household income, uh, you know, put it in a context that people can gain a better understanding. Uh, and, and what's been happening, quite frankly, is that the government's been mortgaging the future of our country, of our children, our grandchildren, and future generations at record rates. Uh, and in all likelihood, what's going to happen is it's not going to be you and I that are going to pay the bill. Uh, it's going to be our kids, our grandkids, and future generations. Uh, and that one of the things that has to happen is that we need to get our elected officials to start recognizing the reality that we've got to start making some tough choices on spending and revenues and a variety of other things so that we can stop the bleeding and stabilize the patient so that we our future can be better than our past and so that we can remain a superpower in 2040 and beyond. Now, we, we just looked at the audited financial statement of the federal government and looked at the financial condition of the government do you have other metrics that you look at when you when you discuss this and, and talk to people about it? Well, first, even when you do that, Sheila, as you know, there are different ways to measure it. OK, for example, uh, I was a trustee of Social Security and Medicare, one of two uh, representing the public for five years uh, back in the early 90s. Uh, we're the ones that blew the whistle to say that Social Security and Medicare were not unsustainable in its present form and started providing a plain English summary of 
the results of the, the, the current condition and future outlook of those programs. That's fortunately stood the test of time. Uh, you know, and, and, you know, one way you can measure it is on a 75 year horizon. Another way is perpetuity. I use 75 because who knows what perpetuity is and it's the end of time and only God knows that. And he's not telling us. Uh, and then on 75 years, that's long enough to be able to show we got a big problem that grows with the passage of time. Secondly, there's a difference between using an open group. Okay. Uh, which is what social insurance is, or a closed group. I think you use the closed group numbers, if you will, which are bigger, but, you know, the open group numbers are bad too, so you don't have to worry about it. Uh, the other thing is, is there's a difference between cash basis of accounting and accrual basis of accounting. You know, most government entities use a cash basis for purposes of saying they balance the budget, uh, and they use an accrual basis for financial reporting. Not surprisingly, the accrual numbers are much worse than the cash numbers. Uh, and, and in many cases, you have entities, let's just say like Chicago and Illinois as an example. Uh, My I know, state and, and city. I know, I know I'm getting close <laughs> to home, but let's like Chicago and Illinois, they say they have a balanced budget. Well, how can they be in such deep hole? You know, that's because you know they don't make pension contributions because they do revenue anticipation bonds. Uh, and, 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 you know, and they make the cash work out sometimes by borrowing money. OK, and, and they want to count that as revenue, which is a bad joke. So so look, the, the bottom line at the federal level is the federal government's grown too big, promised too much, subsidized too many, lost control of the budget and has to engage in a fundamental restructuring sooner rather than later and accounting. Is how you keep score. And how you keep score matters, whether you're in business, government, not for profit sector, even in sports, how you keep score matters. And what you're trying to do and what I try to do is to provide a fuller and fairer view of what the situation is so that people will better understand uh, the nature and magnitude of the challenge so that hopefully they will start putting pressure on our elected officials to start making tough choices sooner rather than later, so that the power of compounding can start working for us rather than against us as it is right now. Yeah, and, and one thing I forgot to mention, well, for our participants, um, I'm going to ask David a few questions, but we definitely want to hear from our listeners. So please, in the Q&A, if you have questions for David or myself, uh, just put those in Q&A. And uh, Judy will uh, read them to us and let, uh, let us know. Um, now, you mentioned the word unsustainable, and I, I was surprised when I, when I saw that in the audited financial statements of the federal government. Um, but, but it seems kind of a vague term to me. You know, are you saying the federal government is bankrupt? It's insolvent? What, what, what exactly does this unsustainable mean? Unsustainable means that to the extent that we're growing our debt, faster than our economy, then the relative debt burden increases in perpetuity. That cannot be allowed to happen because ultimately it will result in reduced economic growth, which it's already started to, uh, reduced opportunities for Americans, uh, increasing interest rates, which it's already started to, okay? Uh, you know, uh, in increasing interest expense, and now we're spending more on interest than we are on national defense. Uh, and we get nothing for that. Uh, and, you know, ultimately, if we lose the confidence of our investors, uh, you know, could end up resulting in something much worse uh, from an economic standpoint that wouldn't be confined just to the United States uh, because the, the dollar is the leading reserve currency uh, and uh, the U.S. is the largest economy in nominal dollars, not in purchasing power parity. China is the largest economy in purchasing power parity. But in nominal dollars, we're the largest economy. Uh, and it has been said, if, 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 uh, if America gets a cold, the world gets the flu. But if America gets cancer, and that's what we have, let's be serious. We have fiscal cancer, uh, and, and, and we're not treating it. And you can beat cancer. My wife has beat cancer. Other, many other people have beat cancer. You can beat it, but you got to take tough actions and you got to stick with it. And we're not doing that yet. Well, what some 
I'll say when I talk about this, and I assume you've heard this too, is you know the, the U.S. really can't be that bad, you know, financially because you know people are they we still have confidence in our dollars and and country, uh, people are buying treasury bonds, foreign countries are buying treasury bonds. I I was surprised to find that China is a very large buyer. Um, they might not have the best interest in the U.S., but anyway, that's a whole other topic. But you know. Um, why are people so willing to continue to buy treasury bonds and have confidence in the dollar if we're in such bad shape? Well, first, the largest holder of U.S. debt is the Federal Reserve. We have been self-dealing in our own debt in order to try to hold interest rates down. Uh, and, and, and there need to be a number of fiscal reforms and monetary reforms, including limits on the ability of the Federal Reserve to do that, Okay. Because it's short-term gain, long-term pain. There's a lot of that going on. Short-term gain, long-term pain. Secondly, uh, the largest holder, international holder of our debt is Japan. China is second. But they're reducing their appetite in buying our debt. They can't dump it. They can try to sell it to somebody else, but they can't dump it. They can't ask us to pay it early. Problem is, is a lot of our debt is very short-term, Right. We issued a lot of this debt when interest rates are lower, and then when it rolls over, we're having to roll it over to much higher rates, and that's why we're getting what's called the double whammy, you know, more debt, higher interest rates, and you're rolling over this lower rate debt into higher rate debt, and that's why interest costs have just skyrocketed within the next couple of years uh, and are projected to, to, to grow dramatically going forward if something doesn't happen. Well, um, now... Looking at our financial state of this union, you know, we have revenue at $4.5 trillion. Uh, we have expenses at $7.9 trillion. Um, so in essence, we borrowed, had to borrow $3.4 trillion. And that that's not including, we're not going to include how much the social insurance uh, increased. Um, so if... Well, if we're borrowing that much money, what, what would we do if we could, you know, if, if people quit buying our treasury bonds? Well, first, you're giving me accrual numbers and the borrowings based on cash numbers. Uh, and the cash numbers are lower than the accrual numbers. But basically, we're expected to have cash deficits uh, of, of $2 trillion or more into the, into the future based on current law. And, and, and current law, quite frankly, is not realistic. In, in th That assumption is not realistic in certain regards. One, it assumes that all the Trump tax cuts will, uh, will, will be sunset and won't be extended. I don't think all of them will be extended, but I think some of them will be. Secondly, it also assumes that some of the spending constraints that were in the Fiscal Responsibility Act of 2023 will be continued. Uh, which they've already started to undercut it. So I don't think that's the case. So the projections that we're seeing, quite frankly, I think are un, you know are, are more optimistic than what, what's likely to be the case. That's why we've got to focus on what do we need to do to solve our problem. And I'm happy to get into that uh, at, at the appropriate point in time, because the key is most Americans know we have a problem. The question is, how are we going to solve the problem? Right. And... Yeah, no, and I, I think you might have started this this uh, discussing this and looking at this closely about the same time I did, maybe a little earlier than I did. And I remember, you know, volunteering for the Concord Coalition, and we were we were so upset that they had two hundred billion dollars of debt. That's the good old days. Well, we didn't cross the trillion dollar mark in debt until uh, the Reagan administration, uh, and now we're at. Uh, approaching 35 trillion uh and uh, and again that's just the tip of the iceberg that doesn't count you know the other liabilities it doesn't count the unfunded social insurance obligations lots of ways you can calculate it it's anywhere from 120 plus trillion to over 150 plus trillion you know as we've talked about but it's bad and it's growing faster than the economy okay every major federal agency that means the office of management and budget uh, the Government Accountability Office, uh, the Congressional Budget Office, the Treasury Department, the Federal Reserve, those are the major, you know, fiscal and monetary agencies. Every one of them have said for years, 
that we, we we're on an unsustainable fiscal path. All right. Uh, and it's the job of the Congress and the president to deal with that. The Federal Reserve is responsible primarily for promoting economic growth and stable prices. OK, um, you know, they can't they can't change tax policy. They can't change, uh, you know, uh, spending policy. They can't change regulatory policy. And most of the changes have to be made there. Uh, uh, and they haven't been made. Uh, and the last fiscally responsible president we had was Bill Clinton. We haven't had one since. Yeah, and, and I might have misspoke. I think uh, what I meant to say was that you know, we were worried about $200 billion deficits. Deficits, not debt, yeah. Yeah, and it just seems like, you know, that everybody's cool with a you know, trillion oh. dollar. It's like, why are people okay with this? Well, they don't understand... They don't. Well, first, America is not very good in financial literacy. We don't teach financial literacy. We don't teach civic responsibility. Uh, and, and as a result, they don't really understand it. Secondly, the politicians uh, don't want to make a big deal out of it because they don't want to be held accountable for it. All right. Uh, thirdly, most Americans are living for today. They're not planning for tomorrow. Uh, and, and, and as long as they don't have a real pain today, they don't worry about tomorrow. It's kind of like, you know, gone with the wind. I'll worry about that tomorrow, right? Uh, but now Americans are starting to feel it. Excessive spending, loose money policy, policies has resulted in increased interest rates, increased inflation, okay? Uh, it slowed economic growth. So they're, they're starting to feel it, right? But this is nothing compared to what we'll feel in the future if we don't put our finances in order because no country is exempt from the laws of prudent finance. We're acting like we are, but we aren't. And we're abusing our favored nation status as it relates to having the largest reserve currency in the world. Uh, and as long as people have confidence, then fine. But once they lose confidence, things can spin out of control very quickly. And we don't ever want to get to that point. That's why we need at least two things, uh, which we can go into more. We need a statutory fiscal a sustainability commission that learns the lessons from Simpson Bowles, that will engage the people, set the table for a tough up or down vote where everything's on the table, mandatory spending, discretionary spending and revenues. Everything's not equal, but everything's on the table, up or, up or down vote. And secondly, we've got to have a constitutional amendment. The only thing that will bind current and future Congresses is a constitutional amendment. We need one that limits the growth of government and and how much debt as a percentage of the economy we can take on uh, without a supermajority vote under extraordinary circumstances. Right now, there's no, um, there's no accountability mechanism, uh, you know, a direct accountability mechanism for the failure of the Congress and the president to do their job. Uh, we need to put that in place, like other countries have, including Sweden. No, um, no, no, excuse me, including Switzerland, big difference although Sweden doesn't do this either, okay? Uh, in Switzerland, they have a Swiss debt break. You know, that, that's a good place to start. We need something like that. Uh, you, you know, University of Denver, which I know you're affiliated with, Colorado has the Tabor Amendment, uh, you know, uh, and, and so we can learn from others, but one thing is absolutely essential. We must have a constitutional amendment uh, that will uh, that will re restore fiscal sanity and sustainability. And I'm working with a group of people to make that a reality. Now, is that the balanced budget amendment? No, um, it's not. Oh, okay, budget. all right. Yeah, because I, I had problems with that just because we look so closely at the city, states and cities, and they have balanced budget requirements, but they're, they're still in going into debt because they use budget. Yeah, well, you know, those. not all debt is bad, okay? Uh, if you have debt that's investment oriented, that's expected to generate a positive rate of return, that's OK. Uh, you know, if you have a war or pandemic or something where you have to temporarily take on debt, you know, that's OK, as long as you don't have a bunch of fraud, waste and abuse associated with it, which is a whole nother problem. OK, uh, but too much debt is bad. Uh, and when you're growing your debt burdens faster than the economy, that's unsustainable. Right. So we have too much debt now. As a percentage of the economy, it's projected to get much worse. There's a growing gap between projected revenues and projected spending. Demographics are working against us. Healthcare costs are working against us. Interest costs are working against us. 
you know, you can't grow your way out of this. You can't cut your way out of this. You can't tax your way out of this. Everything's got to be on the table. And we need to do it sooner rather than later, as I said before, so the power of compounding will start working for us rather than against us. Now, we're we're doing this in a, uh, you know, a um, dollar amount. Um, and, uh, you know, some people say you really need to compare it to things like GDP. What 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 other metrics would you use? Well, the, met the metrics that I use uh, are debt to GDP, mandatory spending as a percentage of the budget, uh, and interest as a percentage of the budget. Those are the three macro macro statistics that I use. But to the extent that you're talking about the burden, you know, I think you have to talk about not just the debt. You have to talk about total liabilities. You have to talk about unfunded promises. You need to convert it to per person, per household. You need to benchmark it against median household income. You know, you, you, but, you know, it's also important to help people put this thing in context, right? Uh, a lot of people don't know that, that that most people pay more in payroll taxes than they do income taxes, right? So it's not that they're not paying taxes. They're just not paying any income taxes. In addition, as you know, on the payroll taxes, half of it comes from individuals and half of it comes from the employer, right? Uh, and, and, you know, so, so there needs to be more information provided, more contextual sophistication. Some people think they've paid for Social Security. When in reality, most people get more money, more money back from Social Security than they paid in, even with a reasonable amount of interest. I mean, there's a lot of misperceptions out there. And so one of the things that has to happen is to provide some facts and some contextual sophistication so people have a better understanding uh, and, and therefore a more willingness to be able to engage in some of the reforms that are necessary. Well, you're talking about, you know, you mentioned uh issues about um that you know this is we're mortgaging the future and right. and our grandchildren and and you're and you're rightfully mentioned that you know unless people feel the pain right now it's hard for them to conceptualize you mentioned the payroll tax and my issue with the payroll tax is you have pe young working people that are make let's say they're making to combined eighty thousand dollars a year um, they're paying, you know, 7.65 for Social Security and Medicare. Their employer is paying that percentage. So like 15% of their salary is going into Social Security and Medicare. And that goes to current retirees. And many of those are making a higher standard of living in retirement than the people who are making only $80,000 a year. Yeah. So isn't it hurting those people right now? Well, first, when Social Security was put into place, the average life expectancy was about 65 years, all right? And yet you weren't eligible for the benefit until 65, okay? So, you know, now the average life expectancy is up to upper 70s, and that's a big part of why we've got a financial problem, okay? Secondly, when Social Security was put in place, subsequently supplemented with Medicare, you know, the highest poverty rate in, in, in the U.S. was seniors. But now the lowest poverty rate in the U.S. is seniors. And the highest poverty rate in the U.S. is children, and who represent our future, children. So the, you know this is part an example of how we need to kind of step back uh, and reassess where we are and where we're headed as compared to where we were, uh, and as part of whatever reforms we make, try to uh, uh, reprioritize and recalibrate based upon today and tomorrow rather than the past. Yeah, and if and if you you know if this is you know. The children are in poverty, and again, if their parents are paying, you know, taxes, you know, for Social Security and Medicare benefits for current retirees, you know, you're hurting those children today, and it would be, you know, great to change something so that that isn't harming them today. I I, I just mention it because I, I get nervous of people like, oh, we don't need to worry about this until the future, when I think it's actually harming people today. Well, in the case of Social Security, uh, you know, remember the last time that we reformed Social Security was 1983. And the reason we did it in 1983 is that we were then months or even weeks of the so-called trust fund going to zero. And if the trust fund goes to zero, everybody's benefits would have been cut across the board immediately because that's the way the law works. The modern day equivalent of that is in less than 10 years, uh, benefits under Social Security will be cut at least 20% across the board 
uh, and growing uh, if we don't reform it. Uh, and yet the two major presidential candidates right now say they don't want to touch Social Security. Well, that's that's laggardship, not leadership. Uh, and people don't seem to understand that if you do nothing, you get a 20 percent cut. All right. So I can assure you that that's not equitable, it's not acceptable, and it won't happen. But we ought to reform this thing sooner rather than later so that people can adequately plan, so we don't have to do as much, so that we can phase it in over a longer period of time, as we did in 83. Yeah, I think it would be a, a good, you know, if we had a Ross Perot or somebody who was independently wealthy and could run on an independent ticket and just say, I'm running on cutting Social Security 20 percent. And of course, they would be they would not, you know, everybody would beat them up for it. And it's like, well, no, that's the situation. <laughs> well, no, but that's why that's why my view is and I've done this is if somebody says they don't want to touch it, then you have to turn it right on. them. You have to say, OK, you're for a 20 percent cut because that's what yep. you get. you're for a 20 percent cut. And if you you know that that's what you get. So. But most people don't know enough to do that, right? Yeah, yeah. They uh, want to. Have, they want to have their cake and eat it too. But the, you know, they're not the only people. Oh, I know, I know. Shocking. They they want to give people uh, the, their benefits and services without having to tax them. I, I can't understand that. Um, Judy, I think you had uh, some questions from the audience. I do. One third or more of bankruptcies are due to medical costs. Seniors are facing soaring medical costs. How would addressing this help with expenses and debt? Well, that's correct. The number one cause of bankruptcy is uh, excessive health care costs. And one of the things that has to happen is that we're going to have to engage in comprehensive health care reform because we spend about 20 percent of our economy on health care and we get below average health care outcomes. Uh, uh, and, you know, one of the things that we need to look at uh, is not just what do we need to do with regard to Medicare and Medicaid, but how do we rethink our entire health care system? Um, you know, my, my newest book, American 2040, colon, Still a Superpower, which just came out, it's on Amazon. It has solutions in a lot of these areas, but it has solutions that the American people said, we agree, this makes sense, all right? And one of the things that the American people felt, felt that needed to be considered is we need to separate between unlimited wants in healthcare and broad-based societal needs. And the general view was the federal government ought to assume responsibility to provide universal preventative wellness uh, and catastrophic care. In other words, you know, you need the broadest pool you can for preventative and wellness, uh, uh, and, and you need to you need to be able to provide protection against financial ruin due to unexpected catastrophic accident or illness. There's a lot of other things people may want, but that's something that's in our broad-based societal interest. You can do it through a, the broadest space risk pool uh, and finance that publicly. And then the gaps will be filled in by employers or unions or you know, industry associations or whatever else. Right now, what we've done is we've written a blank check. We promised too much. We, we, we you know, you know, one of the largest tax preferences in the code is for employer provided and paid health care, where you never pay taxes on that. You never pay taxes on it, which disassociates people for the true cost of health care, uh, which provides very perverse incentives. So, uh, you know, the statement is right, but if but if you had catastrophic protection, you'd take care of that issue. But there are much more issues that we need to deal with than that. Now, you mentioned, David, uh, mandatory spending. Um, and, and you know, Congress and the president spent a lot of times on the budget and debating things. Uh, how does that relate to uh, how much how much are they really debating about? Well, that's a great question. You know, uh, I'm going to go back a little way before you and I were born. 1912. In 1912, the federal government was 2.5% of the economy. Now it's approaching 25%, so it's 10 times bigger, okay? In 1912, the Congress decided on 97% of federal spending. The only, thing that it, the only thing that was mandatory was interest on the debt, and that was before the Federal Reserve, so we couldn't self-deem our own debt and manipulate interest rates. We had to pay market rates, okay? Now, 73% of the budget is mandatory. We've written a blank check on 73% of the budget. 
The only thing they debate is the 27%, which, by the way, includes all the express and enumerated responsibilities envisioned by the founders under the Constitution. Read the preamble, compare that to the budget. But in addition to that, when you count the $1.7 trillion in tax preferences or tax expenditures, deductions, exemptions, credits, exclusions, in reality, the Congress is only control controlling about 15% of annual spending. Now, how the hell can you call that a budget? You control, you, you've control. you written a blank check on 85%. You're only controlling 15. And by the way, you know how many times in my lifetime they've done all the appropriations bills on time? Four in 72 years. You gave them an F, I give them an F minus. Oh, I guess we're being nice. Uh, Judy, do you have another question for us? Yes. So I think both of these could probably be answered at the same time. What does closed group mean? And thank you for Mr. Colbert asking this question because both of you talked about a closed group versus an open group. And I don't know the answer to that either. So what is a closed group and who does the audit for the United States government? Closed group means the people that are currently alive. Open group means that you consider, you know, uh, future changes in the workforce, future births, deaths, et cetera. So, uh, you know, which is a, a, a social insurance approach, if you will. Um, uh, the audit of the uh, of the federal government. Well, first, uh, most agencies and departments in the federal government are audited either by the inspector general for the department or by a private sector firm uh, like KPMG, Ernst & Young, whatever. Uh, uh, under the direction of the of the inspector general, some government agencies are audited by the GAO, the Government Accountability Office, which I headed for about ten years. Uh, those are the IRS, which is the revenue, Bureau of Public Debt, which is the biggest liability, uh, and the FDIC, which is the biggest contingent uh, obligation uh, of the federal government. They're audited by the GAO directly. And then the, audit, then the GAO audits the consolidated financial statements of the U.S. government. Every major department agency has been able to withstand an audit except for one, and that's the Defense Department. And they're several years away from being able to, to be able to get an opinion on their financial statements, although, uh, in fairness, the Marine Corps just got an opinion on their financial statements, so that was a good positive first step, but that's a small piece of the overall department. And unless until the Defense Department gets an opinion on its financial statements, the, the GAO won't be able to express an opinion on the consolidated because the DOD is material to the consolidated financial statements. It's about half of discretionary spending uh, and clearly material to the consolidated financial statements. Do you want to add anything, so, Sheila? So they, they don't have enough, um, you know, they're, they're not getting enough information. It's a disclaimer opinion. Part of it's because Correct me if I'm wrong, David, you know, because they, they can't gather, the auditors can't gather enough information or the information isn't reliable. Yeah, the main problem is the Department of Defense. That's yeah, and then yeah. I would ask, so if a defense contractor got that type of opinion on their financial statements, would the federal government do work for them? Uh, well, it, it, the, the more consequence would be is, would, would they be able, you know, what, what effect would it have on their stock price? What effect would it have on their ability to get new contracts? What effect would it have on their uh, on their ability to borrow and at what rate they would borrow? That would be the more practical effect. The problem is the federal government is a monopoly. It doesn't face the same kind of competition the private sector does. It can borrow to an unlimited extent as long as people are willing to lend it money. And so there's not enough accountability for failure to achieve desired outcomes. And it's not just with regard to the audit, okay? A vast majority of federal departments and agencies don't focus on what outcomes are we trying to achieve and how do we measure, how are we doing compared to those outcomes we want to get? In other words, we've got a certain amount of resources, we've got a certain amount of authorities. Uh, how do how are we doing in allocating those resources and authorities to achieve desired outcomes that the American people can understand and relate to? Uh, uh, and I did that at GAO. We, we, we did that. We led by example. We practice what we preach. They continue to do that today, but most department agencies don't. Uh, and, and that's got to change. 
Yeah, I, I was, you know, I, I was surprised when, you know, because as a former, you know, auditor, you know, a disclaimer or even a qualified opinion for on a private sector would be, in essence, the kiss of death. I was surprised when I saw the federal government got it, and I'm surprised that um, state and local government, not a lot of them, but a handful of them are getting disclaimer and qualified opinions. Um, and and I guess, you know, to me, again, it's the kiss of death. We, we seem to put our corporations uh, and worry more about, you know, them and their financial management um, when all, you know, and the stockholders are up and set, the, you know, Congress would call um, the CEOs into, you know, hearings and, but, but for some reason where we don't put the governments up to that same high standard. We should. Um, I think well, I, would, are, I would argue it's more important. Yeah, okay. because yeah. everybody is a stockholder in the federal government and the state that's and local correct. governments. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, and, and so everybody has an interest in it. Whereas with regard to private sector entities, only the shareholders, the bondholders, the employees, uh, and and you know the, their their uh, contractors uh, really have an interest. So the only thing that's everybody is the federal government. And as you mentioned, it's not just the United States. Uh, you know, oh. if 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 something bad happens to us, it's not going to be pretty for the whole world. That's Judy, correct. I think you have uh, a couple more few more questions. Yes. We've been subsidizing excessive expenditures with debt for years, regardless of which presidential administration or the makeup of Congress. But citizens compare our growing lifestyle as better than other nations and therefore don't see how our growing debt is a problem since other nations are also growing their debt. How can we better explain the looming problem as it's not us versus them, but what will happen to us all? Well, the first thing you have to do is you have to help them understand it's already having the excessive spending and mounting debt burdens is already having an impact now. The excessive spending and mounting debt burdens has resulted in somewhat slower economic growth. It's resulted in uh, uh, you know, increased inflation. It's resulted in increased interest rates. It's resulting in increased uh, interest expense for the government of which you, we don't get anything for that, okay? We're paying for past excess uh, consumption, all right? Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing you have to do. You have to help them understand it is having an adverse impact right now. But then you have to also help them understand you ain't seen nothing yet because this is what the numbers look like now and this is what the numbers are projected to look like if we don't do anything. If we continue to play ostrich, put our head in the sands and don't do anything. And, and, and the implications of that are much, much worse than that, okay? The other thing you have to do is you have to appeal to, you know, uh, you know, what are they, you know, to me, the reason I'm in this fight, and I have been for several decades, okay, is not for me. I'm going to be okay. I've, you know, I've, do, I've, I've done enough things to make sure my wife and I are fine. We're okay for retirement. We're going to be just fine. Uh, we're going to be able to maintain our lifestyle or whatever. And I'm not really doing it for my kids. I'm doing it for my grandkids because their life is going to be much, much, much tougher if we don't get our finances in order because tax rates are going to go up dramatically. So, social insurance programs are going to be restructured dramatically. Uh, and, and yet they're going to face a lot tougher competition in an increasingly competitive and interconnected world. You know, that's irresponsible, it's unethical, it's moral, it needs to stop. So I'm I'm really in it because I love my country and I, and I love my family, right? I mean, uh, and, and you've got to appeal that. you you got to appeal to people's head and their heart. Head and heart, both are important. Problem is, politicians don't want to do that because they're focused on keeping their job. They're focused on the next election. And by the way, that's why we also need political reforms. We need redistricting reform. We need integrated and open primaries. We need campaign finance reform. We need two 10 year term limits. We need ranked choice voting. We need a number of things to restore our democracy to, to be a republic that's reflective of and responsive to the general public. We don't have that now. That is not what we have right now. Yeah, I, I you know, I, I'm surprised. I think back, you know, again to the good old days when, you know, 
didn't Americans always have a concept that they were going to leave life better for their kids and grandkids? And why do you think we've gotten away from that? It's called stewardship. All right. It's stewardship. And we've gotten away is leaving things better off and better positioned for the future. OK, we're, we're not even doing number one, much less number two. OK, I personally think the biggest battle that we have in this country right now is not a partisan battle. It's an ideological battle. A battle between those like myself and presumably you and others who who believe in founding principles, limited but effective government, individual liberty and opportunity, personal responsibility and accountability, rule of law and equal justice under the law, fiscal responsibility, intergenerational equity and stewardship versus social estate principles, grow government, increase dependency on government, take control of education, take control of health care, don't worry about deficits, don't worry about debt. Live for today, don't worry about tomorrow. That's the stark difference that we face right now. And for during 2021 uh, and 2022, those principles won out, in part because of the flawed and failed modern monetary theory that was followed by the administration and the Congress. Uh, that's you know that should be put in the dustpan of history. Uh, and it's and it and it's caused our excess inflation and some of the problems that we have right now. But but what we haven't done is we haven't taken steps, like I said before, with regard to the commission, with regard to the constitutional amendment, to stop the bleeding and and, and cure the disease. That that's where we are now. Okay, we've got to we got to stop the bleeding. We got to we got to stabilize the patient, and we got to cure the disease. Um, yeah, and I've had a chance to speak in a. a few of the states that are doing well that that truly balance their budget don't use budget gimmicks uh to balance their budget and and i've asked the audience and i've asked elected officials there what are those states doing right as far as fiscal responsibility why are they doing right but others and and last week when i spoke in south dakota somebody said the politicians are just honest they and then another person uh, has told me that uh, the budget director of Utah said, you know, she said facetiously here in Utah, we really believe in not um, in only promising and providing the services and benefits we can afford. Um, but it, it, things have just gotten run away. Judy, I think you have some more questions. I do. And I think these two can be combined because it's all about new technology. So how will people fleeing to Bitcoin change dollars and taxing? And artificial intelligence is already starting to disrupt jobs in the market. Do you think this disruption on top of crushing debt are a perfect storm for another depression? Well, personally, I'm not a Bitcoin fan. I don't I don't own crypto. Uh, to me, it, it's more akin to gambling uh, than it is to anything else. And I'm not a big gambler. Uh, I also have a concern because a lot of illegal activity goes on uh, using cryptocurrencies. Uh, and uh, it's not as uh, transparent or traceable uh, as I think it needs to be in order to ensure compliance with tax laws uh, and with uh, uh, economic sanctions uh, imposed on certain regimes and individuals and things of that nature. Uh, I also don't believe that the, the contrary to widespread speculation that the federal government will ever be able to go to a total digital currency. Um, I don't think the American people would stand for that. I don't think the American people want the federal government to know everything they're spending money on uh, and to be able to have some type of control or influence uh, over that. Um, uh, so so that's that's on the Bitcoin. AI, AI is going to be a plus and a negative. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a real potential for... for uh, breakthroughs on R and D. It's a it's a real potential to help increase productivity, uh, uh, to help in, enhance economic growth. But it also means that we'll end up doing things a lot differently, uh, and it also potentially could be a major disruptor with regard to jobs uh, and certain occupations that uh, are, um, you know, can be uh, more easily automated, uh, if you will. Uh, and so I, I think you know we'll we'll have to wait and see, but it 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 will it will have pluses and minuses, uh, and the distribution will not be equal. Uh, I just had a conversation this morning about this, and you know about 
what is the federal government doing to try to be able to assess uh, you know, how AI can and should be used and, and what are the potential implications, uh, you know, for the country and, 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 and for how the government does business. Oh, thank you. And, and you had sent us some, um, some slides, um, which, um, which, you know, kind of numerically explain this and, and go, you mentioned that, you know, things uh, look really bad in the future. We will be sharing those and obviously attributing you um, on our website, truthandaccounting.org, so so people can you know go to that. Um, now, um, I think you've answered this, but I just wanted to make sure is um, what what if we do nothing? What, what if what if you know? To me, it you know they just continue to you know you and I have been talking about this for a long time, and they just continue to be heading down the wrong road. Well, unfortunately, the numbers have gotten a lot worse. I mean, the hole's a lot deep, deeper. The gap between revenues and expenditures is a lot wider. Um, you know, I mean, uh, only God knows when the day of reckoning is coming and God's not telling us. Uh, but by definition, if it's unsustainable, it means it will come to an end. Uh, and if it comes to an end, if we don't end up taking steps to put our finances in order, which we, means we can avoid the, those those unpleasant trees, okay, uh, then it won't be pretty, okay? Uh, as you know, as I said, you know, we're, we're seeing a little bit of the effect right now, okay? We're, we're, you know, the excessive spending results in higher deficits, more debt, higher inflation, uh, higher interest costs, uh, slower economic growth, uh, you know, uh, and, and so we're seeing some of it now. Put it on steroids, okay? Uh, you, you, all those things are not good. Okay, do you want them to get worse or do you want them to get better? Right. Well, haven't I? I think you've studied uh, more than I have on other um, governments, other civilizations that have gotten into this trouble. Uh, are are we on the road to Rome or Venezuela? Well, or... Let's talk. Let, let's talk about Rome, okay? Because okay. one of the things, <laughs> one of the things I'm a big believer in is learn from history and learn from others. Okay. I'm, I'm going to give you a, a, a lesson from Rome. Rome was the greatest superpower, arguably, in, of all time, arguably. It lasted a, over a thousand years, about 500 years as a republic, and then the republic fell, and it became an autocracy for about 500 years. We haven't been a republic that long, and hopefully we'll never be an autocracy. But the Roman Empire which controlled most of the known world at that point in time, uh, fell for several reasons. See if these sound familiar. Fiscal irresponsibility. Check. Polit political <laughs> incivility. Check. Moral decline. Check. Overextended military. Check. And inability to control its borders. Uh, check. <laughs> All right. And then let's go to the second re uh, lesson from history. George Washington, our first president in his farewell address, issued four warnings. Avoid excessive debt. We're there. <laughs> avoid, well, we're not, we're not there. We haven't avoided it. Uh, avoid foreign wars. Uh, we haven't. Avoid regionalism, which remember the Civil War, among other things. Uh, and then, then there's a new movie, I understand, entitled Civil War, which I want to go look at. And then avoid factionalism. And by that, he meant political parties. So we have we've ignored that too. So, you know, and, and yet when, when we look to other countries, you know, Switzerland and et cetera, you know, there are there are examples out there of people who have had similar challenges, uh, rose to the challenge and took steps and are in great shape now. And that's all we need to do. We just need to deal with the biggest deficit we have, which is a leadership deficit. Well, and you mentioned a leadership deficit and I and I've thought about that long and hard. And, you know, shouldn't we be, and we haven't we elected people um, based on what we've wanted? Um, you know, so so a lot of people, it's like Congress and the president need to really, really be doing stuff. But isn't it really up to the voters to really elect people to take the leadership? To yeah, the system, the, the system's broken. Okay. First, there's only one person that's elected by all the people. That's the president. There's only one person that has the bully pulpit. That's the president. Okay. 
So if a president doesn't want to make this a priority, you're going nowhere fast. Okay. Secondly, make it a priority if the citizens don't want it to be a priority. Well, that's what leadership is. Uh, I, I don't. I, I reject that because I, I did a ten thousand mile, twenty seven state fiscal responsibility tour in twenty twelve, along with Alice Rivlin, may God rest her soul, Bell Sawhill, and others, and we got seventy seven to ninety seven percent agreement from representative groups of voters on budget reforms, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, health care, defense, taxes, government organization operations, and political reform. 77 to 97%. The answer, so you think the president should be doing a similar? I think the president, I'm not, the, I'm not blaming President Biden. I, I, I'm saying any president. Yeah, the commission that I talked about needs to be charged with doing that. With the support of the president and leaders, and but they need to be charged with doing that because the answers lie with the people. So, so you, you you engage them, you set the table for an up or down tough vote. But in order to be able to make sure that it can be sustained over time, you have to have the constitutional amendment. You have to have the requirement that says you can't continue to mortgage the future. You have to start making tough choices. Debt to GDP is pro-growth. Because if you grow the denominator faster than the numerator, you're making progress, even if the numerator is going up. But on the other hand, we're doing the opposite right now. We're growing the numerator much faster than the denominator. So it says you can't do that. So you got to figure out what you're going to do on spending and or revenues. And also there are things you can do to enhance growth. OK, deregulation and, you know, rationalizing the size of government. But but you, you got to do that. And if you don't do that, there are consequences, you know, surcharges, dividends, you know, whatever. OK, right now, there's no consequences. No, there's no consequences. So well, I, the consequences that if you if you don't give more services and benefits than you don't get reelected. Well, but here's the problem with the political system. OK. We have a republic that's supposed to be a representative democracy. Um, depending upon which polls you go by, 43 to 48 percent of voters, including me, are independent, unaffiliated. That's the only thing growing. The parties have lost market share big time. The wing nuts have taken over the parties. The far left controls the Democrats. The far right controls the Republicans. About 90 percent of the districts in the House are gerrymandered. Uh, and so they're, they're not deciding the general election. They're deciding the primary. Very low turnout. The party activists are the ones that turn out. And so you have not just partisanship, you have a huge ideological divide, all right? Nobody wants to compromise. That's complicated by the fact that, you know, um, the margins are very close, and therefore every election is about control. And there's a huge difference between whether or not you're in the majority or minority, especially in the House. There are no minority rights in the House, okay? And, and so, you know, we've got a perfect storm politically where we don't have the leadership from the top, where we have a gerrymandered system, you, you've got no term limits, so you've got career politicians, okay? You've got campaign finance, where a lot of the biggest races are decided by dark money and money from people who can't vote in the election, right? So so we, we have to analyze what the disease is, and then we have to figure out what do we need to do to address it. All these issues, by the way, I'm talking about are in the book. Every, every one of them is in the book, and here's how you solve the problem. But again, it comes to leadership, right? I mean, you know, and we don't have that. And we haven't had it for a long no, time. No, you're, you're exactly right. Uh, Judy, do you have another audience question? I do. And would open primaries help with this situation? Yeah, yeah. In, integrated in open primaries. By that, I mean... Everybody gets to vote in the primaries, Democrats, Republicans, unaffiliated, whatever. You can be whatever you want. Parties can endorse people, you know, for the primaries. That's OK. But you have one primary, the top two runoff in the general election, even if they have the same political affiliation. All right. By the way, California already does that. Yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, I think that's a great idea, but nobody really listens to me. The The next question is, could you share your opinion on the impact Vivek's Ramaswamy's proposals to reorganize the government will have on our future? As you know, he 
ran on, you know, cutting what every third government employee and reducing. No, no, he wanted he wanted to cut seventy five percent of the government. There you go. Um, uh, you know, one I think Ramaswamy was a very bright guy. Uh, I I totally agree that we need to right size the government. Uh, as I said, government's grown too big. Uh, you know, it, it's 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 far it's gone far beyond what the founders intended for the federal government to do. Far beyond. Okay. Uh, it also has not been very effective in delivering on its promises. So, you know, and I do believe that the government can be significantly reduced in size. Uh, uh, but again, that's going to take a president who's willing to lead, uh, and it's going to take uh, a multi-year commitment uh, to be able to, you know, make that a reality. Uh, and uh, but it's clearly a need. I, I did that at GAO. I mean, uh, you know, we 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 did our first ever strategic plan, reorganized our agency based on the plan, eliminated a third of our offices, reduced headcount by 13%, uh, leveraged technology, uh, uh, eliminated a layer of management, consolidated the number of units from 35 to 13, focused on outcomes rather than activities. Bottom line is we, we, were, you know, we were smaller, uh, but, but we were 50 to 100% more productive three times the outcome-based results and generated over a hundred dollar return for every dollar invested in the agency. That what we did is transferable and scalable to the rest of the government. But I had the ability to do it because I had a long term and I was committed to do it uh, and, 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 and pushed it. And I'm pleased to say that my successor, Gene Dodaro, who's the current controller general, who was my number two and who helped to implement these changes, they've been sustained. Because the real key of transformational change is, you know, 10, 20 years later, has it stuck? Because, you, you know, the current leader can force it to stick, but, the, but, but successful leaders may or may not keep it, but it's stuck. Now what we need to do is we need to take that concept, need to apply it government-wide, in particular in the Defense Department, but not just the Defense Department. No, thank you. And one question I get a lot, and I think our listeners would really... Um would really love to hear as you know we're talking about bad numbers and and things aren't going to happen well aren't going to end well if we don't make changes and we you know so a lot of people don't see changes being made what what could an what could an individual do to protect themselves what what planning should they be doing well it's something i talk about the book too i talk about what i've done right i mean and so you need to understand several things one tax rates are never going to be lower than they are now they're only going one way. That's up. Income tax rates. I mean, it's just math. All right. Secondly, social insurance programs are going to be reformed. Uh, you know, and and now the younger you are, the wealthier you are, the more you're going to be affected. All right. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the government doesn't provide long term care unless you're poor. And so long term care can be very expensive. Uh, it's something you need to plan for. Um you know, you, 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 you know, I, way I look at it is I, I want to make sure I've got an adequate amount of guaranteed retirement income for my entire life. And I've done that. And I've done that through various annuities, some of which are indexed to inflation or other factors. Uh, and, 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 and if I ensure that, then I have a lot more flexibility and, and I can sleep a lot easier at night because anything else is gravy. All right. And I, you know, I need to, you know, I'll invest that and, plan tax strategies and all on that uh, it, well to preserve it for either my family or for charities or in my case, both. But uh, so, you know, it, it, I'm a big believer in practice what you preach, lead by example. And so a lot of speeches I give, I talk about the big picture and what the implications are for individuals. And then what I've done to try to consider what's likely to happen and and what can I do to protect myself and my family? Uh, and that's how people ought to be looking at it. Now, what they also need to do is they need to vote. They need to push their elected officials to be able to start focusing on these issues. They need to push, you know, the need for the fiscal uh, commission. They need to push the need for a constitutional amendment. I mean, you know, we need to we need to put pressure on our elected officials to be able to do something that can change the course of history. And do you have faith in the American public that this will, that 
I do. I mean, I the the three most it on a good note. <laughs> the three most important words in the Constitution are the first three: "We the people." We are responsible and accountable for what does or does not happen. We're a hell of a lot smarter than the politicians realize. We are the answer. We just need to get on with it and to hold them accountable. Well, we really appreciate everything you're doing. Um, I know, you know, you and I are both uh, not hired uh, non-for-profit people. We're, we're doing this on our own. Um, and so we really appreciate your effort. And uh, again, we, we will have this video along with other material on our Truth and Accounting website. And again, I can't thank you enough, David, to, for everything you do and uh, for, for uh, joining us today. Fine. And if people want to find out more about the uh, book, go to uh, americain2040.com, americain2040.com. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Take care.